We talked a little bit last week about the lighthouse, talked about our opportunity as a church family to be a light in the midst of a dark world, about God reminding us and requiring us to be light in the midst of darkness. Let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. There is a connection between what we do and how great God is glorified. There's an opportunity that we have to let the world know that we're just not people going through life without purpose, without plan, without intention, but rather that that connection that we have to the one that's greater causes us to live a certain way so someone around us will know there is a better way. We'll know that there is not just an impossibility in the midst of a world that doesn't seem to know which way it's going right now. We're talking about being a lighthouse in the midst of a dark world. We talked about that for a little while, and, and uh, I thought about that a number of times through this week. God challenging me personally to let my light shine. How can I let my light shine? How can I brighten my own light? What can we do? And, and it seemed that that's a very... Um, it's a good place to be, to, to check your motives, to check your intentions, to take a look on the inside. you got to clean some cobwebs out sometimes. Someone say amen. Um, you know, every now and then you just got to kind of do house cleaning. you gotta, you got to re- remind yourself of why you are who you are. But through the course of the week, it, it just settled in my spirit that I, I don't want to just be a passive light in the midst of a dark world. I don't just want uh, this to be a passive thing that I'm waiting for someone to notice me. Believe me, I do enough so many times that people notice me. Poor, poor guy yesterday coming through the Canadian Tire parking lot. Kathy and I were just waiting to go into a parking place. And, and he had those, you know, those mucklucks on or boots on that, that they, they, you wrap the laces around the top of the boot. Well, he hadn't wrapped his laces around the top of the boot and the catches for the laces got caught in each other and he went down right in front of us wham he didn't put his hands out he just went he went down so hard that Kathy said I'm just going to look at my phone because I don't want her to think that I saw that literally she's like I rolled my window down, pulled alongside and said, are you okay? Because you just face plan. I don't know if he didn't want to hurt his phone. I don't, know if, I don't know if he didn't care about his nose. I don't know. I don't know how, but he just kind of wham. Believe me, there's been times when I do enough to get noticed. I feel, I've been that guy before. I, I've, I've been that guy with, with, with being, being <clears throat> uh, just doing something that people, I, I'm getting the wrong notice. I'm sending the wrong message. I, I, I don't want, I don't want pe- people to notice me for that reason. I'd just rather be passive sometimes. But then there are other times when we are called to be actively engaged in reaching the world. That we're to make a difference. That we're to stand out. That we're to separate ourselves from just the normal and the routine. And that we, we kind of step out from the crowd to be a part of a solution and not a problem. That we step out from the crowd to be a part of a light in the midst of a dark world. I'll bring it a little closer to home this morning. So we can step out from the crowd to reach someone that's lost and perishing. And bring them into hope and salvation. That is what we're talking about this morning. I, I just don't want to be a part of the crowd waiting for someone to come along and say, you know, I just noticed there's something different. I think that there's something about us that we can reach out to someone and say, are you all right? I saw the way that you went down. I saw what's happening in your life. I'm not ignorant. I, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm aware that you're walking through a valley right now and I just want you to know that God can make a difference in your life. It's as simple as that, that we all of a sudden go from being a passive light in a lighthouse to becoming engaged in reaching the lost. God is calling us today to help save lives. God is looking for life savers. God is looking for life savers. I don't know if you've ever been uh, close to a a death or a near-death experience. I, I don't know if you've ever been there when somebody almost or maybe did lose their life. It's impacting. It's 
It, it, it rests in your spirit. There are times, uh, as bad as your memory may be, you never forget a moment like that. I remember, I'll just keep it a little bit light right now. My friend Gary Bartlett and I, we were traveling from Fredericton back to St. John one night. And, uh, and we both liked motorbikes back in the day. Um, we were dumb and young. And, and <clears throat> I, I think somebody wrote, maybe Ruben, Peter Paul wrote this week. He said, if you didn't realize that you were an idiot when you were younger, you probably still are. We were an idiot. We were just idiots. And I, and I remember that we left Fredericton. It was a beautiful summer evening. We we're traveling back home. We lived in St. John, and and we were traveling on the road, and and uh, we, we were clipping along. We weren't we weren't being absolutely crazy. We weren't being total fools, but we were being foolish enough. And we were driving, clipping along a little over the speed limit, and and I was behind <clears throat> Gary, and he was up to the right. Uh, front ahead of me and I was back behind him on the left and we were probably about six or seven bike lengths apart and, and, and it had happened so fast a moose in the Gary Woods came out up onto the road and he didn't see it but he literally it, from my vantage point it looked like he went right under the head of the moose it scared me it scared the moose the moose reared up on its back legs, twisted. I didn't know a moose could move like this. Twisted in the air, went back down into the woods. I pulled over because I thought that was nothing but the saving hand of God. I, I, I pulled over to the, the side of the road, and a few minutes later, he came back. He said, what are you doing? I said, did you not see that? He said, no, I, and, and a car behind me that had seen the same thing. There was a, a yellow Camaro that had been kind of driving along with us. He pulled over, and he came up, and he said, that was unbelievable. That was so close. It's a wonder you're not dead. And, and of course, Gary was just kind of saying, I don't know what happened. What happened? And I said, you, like, kissed a moose with your helmet. <laughs> you did, like, Whoo. And he didn't like it. The moose didn't like it. Um, but uh, it just, it was so close. Uh, uh, you never forget moments like that. It was just like, it could have been, if it just a, a fraction of a second, just a, a, a movement probably with, within one foot to the right, and, and it would have been a, a tragic, different story. It would have, it would have been just that, that situation. You never forget a moment like that, and, and you, don't, you don't forget it later when you're driving at night either. You slow down, you, you move to the center of the road, you got your eyes peeled, you don't take your eyes off for one moment of where you're going because you know what could or might happen. It's, a, it's those experiences that, that just they're, they're, they move into the midst of your being. You don't forget them. I remember another time we were in Portland and, and uh, Kathy and I were there. I think Tony Mancino and his wife were with us, some friends from St. John at the time. And, and we were, the ladies were doing some shopping and we were in the food court. And there was a gentleman, I heard a little commotion behind me, I turned around and there was a gentleman at a table and, and he had been eating, <clears throat> uh, I think it was melon balls, he had been eating some melon balls and he had swallowed this, this melon, piece of melon and it was stuck in his throat and his wife, an elder lady, was trying to help him and assist him and trying to get, get him up and, and, uh, and it, was, it was just remarkable, there was another lady that was there and she just, before I even had a chance to respond, before Tony had a chance to get up, she came over and she just stepped behind him, she said, I'm going to do the Heimlich and she just kind of, whoom. Gave that one little shot. His face had been, been turning blue and, and a melon ball popped out onto the table. And, and, and I said to Tony, he said, she literally just saved that man's life. She literally just saved his life. He, and and I, I, was, I was moved and I was, and she just, she played it. She was just as cool as a cucumber. She went back over and she had some kind of little salad. She was a little thing, just a little tiny girl, lady. And she sat down, she said, some. Like if that had been me, I was like, ah, I just saved his life. <laughs> right now, right here, look at that. That melon ball was in his throat. <laughs> and I did this. And she's just she's trying to still get composed. I, 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 I don't know how. We're supposed to react. But all I know is that at the end of the day, there was a gentleman that went home with his lady that wouldn't have 
if someone hadn't acted, if someone hadn't got engaged in the process of saving a life, if someone hadn't said, you know, right now is the right time to engage. I, I can't just kind of sit back and say, you know, I got first aid, got first aid, uh, you know, I'm going to let my light shine, I've got first aid. While someone is, is perishing, while someone is lost, while someone is, is needing a savior, while somebody is waiting for somebody to get engaged. I, I just came to remind us all that our world doesn't just need lighthouses. Thank God for them. Thank God for our opportunity, our ability to let our light shine. But God is speaking to the church and saying, our world is in desperate lead, need of a life saver. God is looking for someone to get engaged in the process of reaching and allowing someone to come into that place called salvation. Our world needs lifesavers today. How is it? How is it that we are so moved by the potential loss of temporary life, but we become calloused to the inevitable loss of eternal life? What about billions of souls that we rub shoulders with every day? I mean the church, and, and yet... Sometimes we are able to seemingly dismiss the inevitable loss of eternal life. Why is it that new converts are some of the most effective evangelists when those of us that know so much more are unengaged? Why is it that the longer we are saved, the less likely we are to evangelize? Have we forgotten the price for the eternal. Jesus reminded us for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There is nothing in this world worth more than one soul. There is nothing in the world worth more than one soul. It's a parable, but I'll remind us about it this morning. If you've heard it before, that's all right. It was a, a life-saving station. The dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occurred. There was a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut. There was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. And with no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station, so it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas, they wanted to be associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station weren't happy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped, so they felt a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in an enlarged building. And now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they redecorated it beautifully and furnished it as a sort of a country club. Less of the members were now interested in going on the life-saving missions to sea. So they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The mission of life-saving was still given lip service, but most were too busy or lacked the necessary commitment to take part in the life-saving activities personally. And it was about this time that a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some spoke strange languages, and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up, so the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal pattern of the club's activities, but some members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. They were voted down. They were told that if they wanted to save the life of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, that they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. And as the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. 
They evolved into another country club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. And if you'll visit the seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive, beautiful seashore clubs along Along that shore, but shipwrecks are still inevitable and frequent in those waters. It's just that now, most of the people drown. Life savers. How could it be that the people saved refuse the responsibility to seek and to save those that are lost. As a church, we must never forget our purpose. We are not a social club. We're not a political organization. We are life savers. God has not changed his position on salvation to seek and to save that which is lost. From the Old Testament through to the New, you'll find that God referred to himself in his own word about his purpose, his agenda, his plan. Psalm 18 says, the Lord liveth, blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. 2 Samuel 22 said, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. 2 Samuel 22 verse 47, it said, the Lord liveth, blessed be my rock. And exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. 2 Samuel 22 verse 36. He said, thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. And thy gentleness has made me great. 2 Samuel twenty two fifty one is referred to as the tower of salvation. In Psalms 27, he is the, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In Psalm 140, he is the strength of my salvation. Isaiah 61 and verse 10, it says that he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. I don't know if you're getting a picture or not, but, but we are to be in, in, completely enclosed, surrounded, and a part of being touched by God's salvation. God hasn't left us just kind of... In this passive role of, of being saved, God said, I'm clothing with you with a salvation. I'm, I'm putting a shield of salvation in your hand. I'm, I'm challenging you to be the horn of salvation. If, if God is that intent about our lives being totally surrounded with salvation, then how much more does God intend for his church to become life savers? I, I don't know if you're just, it's all right for that little challenge to rest on us for a few moments. It's, it's okay because God is, is calling us to be a life-saving station. God is calling individuals. It, it, it's to be a part of a group of people that say, you know what? I understand that there are people in the world that are perishing, but I also understand that God has called me to reach those that are perishing. I, I don't know if we just took a few minutes and reminded ourselves of some of the old songs that we used to sing but it was constant that we were engaged in a challenge that we were engaged in saving the lost I don't know if you remember some of those old songs that, 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 that they reminded us about what it was like to be someone say it saved God saved us God reached us. God picked us up. That, that's the power of testimony is that we're reminded about what God has done in our lives. We're reminded of what we used to be, but what we are now. I, I thank God that sometimes we testify to one another about what God has done. We remind ourselves. I'll tell you why. Because it restores the joy of our salvation. No wonder the psalmist said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Because if you're restored Stored in the joy of salvation, then you're willing to let somebody else experience the joy that came into your life. If you're in the room today and the joy of salvation is not yours yet, we just came with a reminder that this still is a life-saving station.
This still is a place where people are saved. This still is a place where you can come to an altar and you can lay your past down. You can lay sin down. You can lay everything that you were down and you can turn to walk in a brand new way. You can turn to walk in a brand new life. There, there still is a baptismal tank that's warm and ready. I'll tell you why. Because God's still in the business of saving souls. You still have got to repent. You still have got to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. I'll tell you why because God turns lives around this still is a life saving station and God doesn't leave us empty it said that he'll fill you with his spirit he'll pour it into your life and you can leave to live a brand new life in Christ this is this is a life saving station thank God for it I'm grateful for it I'm thankful for the lives that have been changed I'm thankful for families that have been restored and renewed by the power of God. We watched drug addicts walk in the door, but they walked out changed by the power of God. We've seen alcoholics come to altars and God turn their lives around. Why? Because God said, I'm still saving lives. I'm grateful that we get to be a part of a group of people who still love the fact that God turns lives around. I love you. This is, this is more than just a group of people. This is more than a country club. This is a family of people that are committed to saving the lost. But God is calling us in 22 to be a greater force in salvation than we've ever been before. Oh, I I love the song we used to sing. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Oh, here's the part I love. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. I know it. Does anybody else remember? That love lifted you up. It lifted you out of miry clay. It put your rock, your feet on the rock. The rock of salvation became real to you. I thank God his love still lifted me. But the song, you see, in, in those old songs, it wasn't just about what God had done for us. There was a constant reminder about what God could do for others. Second verse goes something like this. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. But the master of the sea billows his will obey. He, your savior, wants to be saved today. You see, it was about what God had done. God restored the joy of our salvation. It was about what God had done in our lives, but it didn't stop there. The songwriter would go on to say, you don't have to be in this lost place. You don't have to stay in the dark waves. You don't have to stay in the perils of the sea. We are, come on, we are a part of people that are engaged in this process of lifesavers. We're reaching for you with this song. We're reaching for you with our lives because God... God wants to lift you as well. How many remember the song? There's a call comes ringing over the restless waves. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. And then the chorus would go, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, and let it shine forevermore. We have heard that second verse, the Macedonian call today. Send the light. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I, I know there's a little bit of that conviction. I prayed, I prayed this morning, God, would you bless us with burden this morning?
Come on, we have heard. There's a cry in our world today. Send the light. You see, God, uh, God is, is, is engaging the church like never before. Sometimes we, uh, as, and I'm not trying to go back on what we preached about last week. We talked about the lighthouse. Give me one second. I got a little prop here. I, I'm grateful for the lighthouse. We need to be light in the midst of darkness. But there are other times when we can't just stay passive, where we... Well, we got, we've got to get engaged in reaching. Because there are, there are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. And someone has got to be willing to reach out and fire that preserver, that lifesaver into the waves of the deep. Because somebody is waiting for what you've got. That's why the psalmist said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Because sinners are going to be converted. Sinners are going to be changed. Lives are going to be reached. And when you get the joy of salvation at work in your spirit, you're saying, you know what? I just got to tell somebody about what God has done in my life. I, I got to tell somebody about the saving power. I got to tell somebody about what God can do. This is what reached me. And I know it can reach you. You don't know how far down my life was. But God brought me up oh it was a it was a terrible circumstance it was a terrible situation the depths were there but God reached for me and brought me in to a place of salvation the lifesaver reached me at the right time the lifesaver got to me when nobody else could get to me the lifesaver was there I'm telling you that we are a church that needs to declare God is still in the business of saving lives That's okay, it might save somebody. We have heard the Macedonian call. Without a doubt, we want to see many saved. We want to see the building filled. We want to see the sanctuary flooded. A city impacted. As in the book of Acts, it said that there was much people in the city, Jesus came and declared it. The word came. But that word that came to Paul was because he had taken time to reach for one. Sometimes I, we like the life raft idea because it's a whole bunch at one time. But I, I'm stirred in my spirit because I believe that God is shaking our paradigm of what end time revival looks like a little bit. Because I would love to see people just stream in and I believe that it can happen. But I also know that it's probably going to happen with one soul at a time. It's probably going to be that when enough people say, you know what, I can do that. If Pastor Jack can do that, then I can do that. It, 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 it's just a matter of, of throwing the life preserver to someone. Just one. Just one. Just one at a time. And God is going to reach one at a time. It happened in Acts over and over again. Have you ever thought that that often wasn't, I, I thank God for Acts chapter 2 when thousands were added to the church. I'm, I'm grateful that God added daily to the church such as should be saved. I'm grateful for that. But there was often when it was just the preaching to the one. The one. It was the one Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. It was the one man of Macedonia. It was the one Ethiopian eunuch. It was the one Saul of Tarsus. It was the one Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. It was the one. It wasn't a lifeboat that was sent out. It was a life preserver. It was just a lifesaver sent to one. And sometimes, church, we've got to remember God is going to use someone to reach someone else one at a time. And then watch what happens when the pole comes in and the world is converted watch what happens when revival occurs but it simply happens when someone reaches one we can come back to the music this morning there is an SOS being sent out by the world it all looked very promising the water was warm and calm the seaside was welcoming the crowds were assuring but there is a riptide in our world that are pulling, it's pulling people out and they're being lost. 
It pulls them deeper than they're ready to go. I, I remember this one time we, <clears throat> we were in Florida and Steve Morehouse and I, we decided that we wanted to go to the beach. Well, we're, we're Pentecostal kids, so we don't mix bathe. We go and we find this beach where there are miles when there's nobody else. That's great for privacy, but it's very poor. It's also probably a place that nobody decided was a good place to be. And there we were, and we were enjoying the, the waves, and we were body surfing in. But it wasn't a very popular place because there wasn't anybody there. We were alone. You could look that way as far as you wanted, nobody. Look that way as far as you wanted, nobody. And that's all great for privacy, but it's very poor. But what happened next, I, we were kind of riding the surf and then swimming out to catch the next wave. And before long, I noticed how we were just slowly moving further and further out. I said, well, I, I was standing in water up to here and it was a long, long sandy shoal. But every time that I tried to swim back in, I couldn't swim harder than the tide was pulling me. And I, I'd swim, and then I'd stand back up and to rest, and the water was getting deeper. And Steve was there. I said, Steve, I can't get in. I can't get in. And the minute that I would try, and I'd feel that tide pushing back on me. And the minute I would get enough strength to swim again, I'd start swimming, and that tide would pull. And then it was scary. I was like, I don't want to get out so far that I want to go to rest. There's nothing there. See, that? that's so much like the world right now. They're, they've been told it's water's calm and inviting and it's warm. Water was warm. It was just pulling me out to sea. And there was nobody. Nobody to call on. No lifeguard to call to. No life preserver. Steve was smart enough. He said, Jack, you got to swim on an angle. You can't try and swim straight in. Swim sideways toward the shore. So instead of then, I, I rested until things were ready. And then instead of just fighting the tide straight on, I, I began swimming sideways and I worked my way back in. Next time my feet were put down, I was shallower water and made my way back in. But it was in that moment, I, I realized what a, how horrible it was to know that in my own strength, with my own knowledge, with my own ability, I didn't have, I couldn't get back to shore. If Steve hadn't been there, well, I don't know, I don't know what would have happened. I, well, I, I probably wouldn't have been there without him. But again, that, that moment of somebody saying, I, I know the way that you can get in. I wish that it had been a life preserver story. It would have been so much easier. But I, I would think that probably that day, with my knowledge and the fear factor that was setting in, panic that was rising, and very well could have been that if he had not been there to encourage me and tell me how to get out of the mess that I was in, I may never have made it. simple little story but I'm wondering if there's somebody in your life in your sphere of influence and they look like they're having a great time it looks like everything's all hunky door it just looks like wow I wish that I was them but really they're sinking fast really they're on their way out the riptide is pulling and unless somebody has a word of salvation for them they're not going to make it Anybody in the room this morning, you know the way home? Anybody know something that somebody may need? Anybody, anybody just know that there is a world that needs what you've got? We don't want to keep that to ourselves. We don't want to leave that. What, what, what a tragedy if people perished all the while we had the lifesaver waiting and ready. It's a challenge. It's a challenge 
to the response that's coming over the restless waves. Send the light. It was intriguing reading about the life-saving stations. It was interesting. There's some actual U.S. life-saving stations that are still, they go in the summertime, they'll go through the role of what they would do when a ship would get stranded in the harbor and the storm was there. They still go through the process of every, every, every twice a week these teams would would practice. I mean, this is going back into the late 1800s, early 1900s. They would practice on what to do so, so that they could speedily save lives. The one narrator said the old wooden ships, they would break up so fast that they had to be prepared that when they got the word that they would engage the team and everybody, every guy, Every man, every woman had their responsibility. They had their role to play. Somebody would get the huge card. Somebody would get the munition. There was a 20-pound weight that was attached to the end of a rope. And they would get this little cannon, and they would fire that off into the harbor. And the goal was to shoot that over top of the ship so that uh, some sailor that, that was there on that boat that was just ready to go down could climb up and get the rope. And a pulley would be sent out on that rope. And another rope with it. And then... Men would be shuttled in from the ship to the shore, saved. But it took people in that life-saving station that were engaged. I they had a little video of a reenactment of it, and there was just everything was perfectly in its place, and the rope was much neater than mine here this morning. All coiled so it could reach out into the harbor. And then there in the video you could see the men that were being shuttled back in. It was like, it's like the vintage zip line. But certain loss became gain because somebody was prepared to save a life. Certain loss became salvation because somebody was willing to get engaged. The world, our world, needs lifesavers like never before. Like never. Paul spoke to young Timothy. He said, this is a faithful saying. I'm worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I chief but he needs someone he's looking for someone to engage in the challenge God needs lifesavers today I'm thankful I'm thankful for the power that comes with prayer and fasting I'm so grateful for so many of you that have signed up and responded to that challenge. We love looking at a calendar and seeing individuals that are saying, I'm going to fast this Monday. I'm going to, I'm going to fast Thursday. I'll fast and pray on Friday. Thank you for that. We're, we're wanting to build that out. We're wanting, we're wanting prayer and fasting to happen every day because we know, we know that prayer changes things. We know that fasting destroys strongholds. We, we know it. We've heard tremendous preaching and teaching about it. But God's still waiting for someone to become a part of that life-saving team. We don't need another country club. It's beautifully warm in here this morning. It's terrible cold outside today. It's very comfortable. Maybe too comfortable. But is it so comfortable here in this environment that we forget that this is what God needs someone to leave with this morning? Is it so comfortable and we, we, we want to create an environment? Pastor Alex, I'm excited about Youth Explosion. I'm looking forward to it. We've all been talking about it. But it isn't just about creating yet another event so we can sense and feel the manifest glory of God. It's about reaching into our world and inviting someone to experience what we've got, the joy of God's 
salvation. If there is someone here this morning and you say, Pastor Jack, I feel like I feel like my life is just it's going down. You came to the right house today. I'm thankful for the beautiful edifice that God has privileged us to have church in. You, you folks are helping us make this a reality. This, the bills are being paid. But let's not forget what God has called us to be. It may be that if you leave, you go down Downing Street, and you hang right and you head down bridge. If you just take a little look on your left there on McGloin, when you're right before you go across the bridge, you'll see, you'll see a nice little chapel. That's where we started. That's where this started. But there was people there engaged with the mentality that said, this isn't just a church. This is a life-saving station. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Yes, be the light. But I like how that songwriter said it, send the light. Would you stand together with me this morning? Paul reminded Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners chiefest to the least. But God has called us to be a life-saving station. We could only grow this little, well, not a little sanctuary. It's 60 feet wide by almost 100 feet long over there. That was the new sanctuary before the new new sanctuary. But the growth only happens because people got engaged this responsibility of saving lives. That hasn't diminished as we've grown. Our responsibility has increased. To whom as much is given, much is required. How many know God did a great work in your life? How many know God saved you when it was impossible? God did a marvelous work in your life. God did a supernatural work. God reached you when nobody thought you were reachable. God did that. I'll tell you why God did that. God did that because he knew that when the joy of salvation sprung up in your spirit that you would get engaged in saving lives. That is our responsibility. Yes, come to church. Yes, be here. That, that, that's a challenge that was given last week. Yes, be a part of, uh, of everything that God is doing in our church family. But more than that, our world needs a church to engage in reaching them today we we are called